Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next statewide synchronous session for Sociology 111, Introduction to Sociology. Today we are going to be covering Chapter 19, Health and the Environment. Some of the things we're going to be looking at, sociological perspectives on health and illness, social epidemiology and health, health care in the United States, mental illness in the United States. Then we'll turn to the environment and begin with sociological perspectives on the environment, environmental problems. Take a look at social policy in the environment, environmentalism. Some of the questions we're going to be trying to answer are, what are the people who cannot afford to drink bottled water supposed to do? Won't the environment eventually threaten everyone no matter how much organic food they consume? What defines a healthy environment? And how does health care vary between social classes and nations? So, beginning with sociological perspectives on health and illness, the first thing we need to do is figure out how, what do we mean when we talk about illness? What do we mean when we talk about health? Health, according to one definition, and this is the definition used by the World Health Organization, is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being and not merely the absence of disease and infirmity. Notice how it has the social well-being in there. This definition recognizes that people, human beings, are social creatures and they have to have a social world and interact socially in order to be considered truly healthy. Isolation can be damaging to human beings. But what we mean when we talk about health, of course, health is socially constructed and we can view it in a social context. What does it mean to be sick? What does it mean to be healthy? How sick is sick? How sick is sick enough to call into work? This is all socially constructed. And the idea behind this from the functionalist perspective is that being sick is a state that absolves you of your normal social responsibility. So from the functionalist perspective, the idea of being sick must be controlled, it must be regulated, so that not too many people are released from their societal responsibilities. If you've ever worked in a restaurant, especially a fast food restaurant, when you get a cold, if you try to call in sick for having a cold, a lot of times you'll be told, suck it up and get into work. A lot of people view a cold as not a serious enough illness to call in sick for. But when we do make the claim of being ill, and that we want to be released from our societal responsibilities. We're expected to exhibit the behaviors associated with what Talcott Parsons called the sick role. And this is societal expectations and attitudes about attitudes and behaviors of a person viewed as being ill. If you call in sick, you should not go out to the movies. You should not go out dancing. Because the behavior expected of somebody who's calling in sick is, is that they will stay home, and if the illness is serious enough, they will contact a doctor. Both of these behaviors, coupled with an attitude that is expected of sick people wanting to, uh, wanting to return to health, the idea is, is that when we use the sick role, the sick role is we're excused from normal societal responsibilities so that we can become healthy again. However, a lot of times when we talk about um, the sick role and who should be allowed to inhabit the sick role, um, what we're looking at there is um, who determines who is sick in society and how sick in society. For this, doctors, physicians, they function as the gatekeepers of the sick role. If we need to take multiple days off from school or multiple days off from work, oftentimes we'll be required to bring in a doctor's note. 
because doctors are the ones, the individuals in society who get to determine how sick is too sick to work, how sick is too sick to go to school. And if we call in sick for one day, usually we'll be allowed to do that without needing a doctor's note. But a lot of places where I've worked say if you call in sick for more than one day consecutively, if you call in sick for two days consecutively or three days consecutively, you will need to have a doctor's note before you can return to work. So the functionalist approach looks at individuals in society as contributing to the social stability. And that's why the sick role needs to be controlled and regulated. Because we can't have too many people inhabiting the sick role and being excused from their societal obligations. Otherwise, society itself breaks down. Moving on to the conflict approach, what we find here is this idea of the medicalization of society. Medicalization of society. It's the growing role of medicine as a major institution of social control. And when we talk about medicalization, think about the medicalization of certain conditions. used to be that like addiction to various things, drugs, alcohol, was viewed as a lack of willpower. It was a failing within the individual. These conditions became medicalized when um, medicine as an institution began saying, we can treat this. We can return these people to a state of health. And so what it does is it kind of restricts who's held responsible for the alleviation of certain conditions. And it expands the domain of expertise. If alcoholism is viewed just as a failure of willpower, well, anybody can help treat that. Once it becomes a medical condition, it restricts the people who are able to treat addiction to train professionals. So it expands the domain of expertise. Then societal problems start to become viewed through the lens of medicine using a medical model. Um, we can see some of this when people talk about addiction to things which were there's some controversy over. Alcohol, yes, we can become physically addicted to alcohol. Drugs, we can become physically addicted to drugs. Gambling, that's kind of becoming a recognized addiction. Um, but there's been some pushback against that because right now we've got people claiming that they can become addicted to sex, they can become addicted to pornography, they can become addicted to a lot of different things. When we start using that addiction, what we're doing is we're viewing social problems, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, pornography, um, sexual um, behaviors, we're viewing them using a medical model. And so as the ex more and more conditions become medicalized, it's the medical institution, of course, retains jurisdiction over health care, but health care has expanded to include things that were formerly thought of as individual problems that people should deal with. So the medicalization of society is one way that conflict kind of takes a look at the practice of medicine. Um, it restricts people who are trained properly, authorized to treat conditions. Um, so it expands the segment of society over which medicine has jurisdiction. Of course, another way we can look at conflict in healthcare, the conflict theory, and apply that to healthcare is when we look at inequality to access to healthcare. There are a lot of inequalities that exist. The more money you have, the better treatment you receive. 
Um, one of the problems that happens, of course, is this idea of brain drain. Last time you went to the doctor, was it a doctor who was born in this country? Or was it a doctor who came from another country to practice medicine here in the U.S.? I'm sure people are aware there are a lot of doctors from India, Pakistan, China, from other nations who came to the U.S. to get education and then wound up staying here to practice medicine. This creates brain drain within the society from which these people came. And the idea of brain drain is that professionals, skilled workers, technicians, whose skills um, and trades would be much more valuable in their home nation have come to the U.S. Um, because of the lifestyle available to them here. Another way we can look at inequality existing in the U.S. with regards to health care, there's dramatic differences based upon race and ethnicity and infant mortality. Amongst African Americans, infant mortality is almost double that than it is in the white population. It's even higher amongst Native American populations. And this is because of inequalities in access to health care. So, conflict, really remember, conflict is all about competition over access to resources. And health care can be viewed as a resource. Who gets access to the best health care? The people with the most money, the people with the most power in society. Who has restricted access to health care? Lower classes, minority groups. And this creates inequalities in health outcomes as well. So moving on to the interactionist approach, remember this is the micro level focusing on individual social interactions between individuals. So the interactionist approach will take a look at the roles within healthcare, say the doctor role, the patient role, and look at how that interaction shapes, or how those roles shape the interaction between individuals. When two people meet on the street, one of them may be a doctor, another of them may be ill, but when people are meeting on the street, they have to take some time sorting out who has higher and lower social status based upon profession, based upon all income, all kinds of things like that. When you go as a patient to see a doctor, the statuses are determined through that particular relationship, that interaction, the roles that you're inhabiting. Now, when we talk about the patient role, the doctor role, um, these are somewhat out of Talcott Parsons work, so they're functionalist ideas behind the role of the doctor and the role of the patient. But when we look at the way that it shapes the nature of interaction from this interactionist perspective, patients oftentimes place themselves completely in the hands of the doctor. The doctor is the authority in that relationship. Despite the fact that it is every patient's right to refuse any type of treatment they want. So interactionist approach looks at the way this gets structured, but it also says that patients need to play an active role in positive or negative health. The choices we make have consequences. Smoking, overeating, um, as indulgences, they have consequences. And so from the interactionist perspective, our behaviors are shaping our health outcomes at an individual level. And then we get to this idea of labeling theory. Now, this is another interactionist perspective approach, uh, but labeling theory is a little bit different. It's about not so much the individual's behaviors, it's how society reacts and labels those behaviors. 
So if we think about being healthy and being ill, these are societal definitions. These are labels externally applied to individuals. You can claim to be ill all you want, but if all of society says you're not ill, you're going to have trouble inhabiting the sick role because it's a social definition. So think about something like homosexuality, same-sex orientation. This used to be viewed as aberrant, abnormal behavior. And homosexuals were labeled as deviants. It was thought that there was something wrong with them. They had a medical condition that was causing the same-sex orientation. As society has kind of become more tolerant towards same-sex orientation, and, med and medicine and psychology, you know, psychology and psychiatry within medicine have examined the nature of homosexual patients, now, homosexuality is not defined as an illness. It is defined just as an orientation. And so, at least the medical profession no longer thinks of homosexuality as deviant behavior. What about, say, having cavities in your teeth? Can you call in sick for having cavities? Um, if you have a very severe toothache, maybe, but if you just have, you know, a cavity that you need to get a filling in, can you call in sick for that? Well, it is an illness. I mean, if you think about it, part of the body is not at 100% healthy condition, your teeth, okay? We don't really view that as an illness, though. Okay, what's referred to as social epidemiology is the study of the spread of disease, distribution of health and impairment across a population. Uh, if anybody's ever seen the movie And the Band Played On, which is a movie, it's, a, you know, a, a, it was a kind of a movie based upon real circumstances, and the circumstances were the spread of HIV in America. And the band played on focuses on the small group of professionals who were searching for patient zero, trying to determine um, what the illness affecting a particular segment of the population was. Uh, this was when it was still called gay cancer in our society, before they had an understanding of it as a sexually transmitted disease. One of the team was a sociologist who specialized in social epidemiology. And it was this individual who actually recognized that when you start building connective networks between individuals who have this affliction, it began looking like a sexually transmitted disease. So when we talk about social epidemiology, we have... Prevalence and incidence. Incidence are the number of new cases of a specific disorder occurring within a given population during a stated period of time, usually a year. Prevalence is how many cases exist at, a, at that given time. Not that are brand new, but all the cases that exist at a, at a given time. Another thing, another factor that we think of when we talk about social epidemiology is what's called a morbidity rate. And a morbidity rate is disease incident figures presented um, as rates within a population. Think about it kind of like as a percentage of a population. But the way that they do that is morbidity is the number of incidences um, per 100,000 people in society. So morbidity rates can be percentages, but what we talk about there is how fast is this spreading, um, how much of our society has been affected by it. 
And then the mortality rate is what percentage or what uh, number of cases per however many are fatal. Influenza is not thought of as a very serious disease, yet influenza does have a mortality rate in the United States of America. There are people who die from the flu every year, but it has a very low mortality rate. It may have a high morbidity rate, but it has a very low mortality rate. So, how does social class play into health? Well, first of all, people from the upper class live an average of seven years longer than people from the lower class, so they have a longer life expectancy. But people in the lower classes also suffer higher rates of mortality and disability. Um, if you've ever heard of what is called sciatica, this becomes a mobility issue with people. Um, what used to be called sciatica um, is the result of herniated discs squeezing on the sciatic nerve and making people unable to walk. You find more people having to live with this condition in the lower classes than you do in the upper class simply because people in the upper class have the money to go to a doctor and get treatment for it. And so when we talk about social class, when we say it appears to be cumulative, access to health care or not having access to health care has a cumulative effect over the course of your life. Somebody who loses health care at 50 could still live a fairly long life if they've had health care from zero through 50, from the time they were born up to age 50. Regular access to health care, regular checkups, things like that. But these effects become cumulative, um, and part of that is because they have reduced access to quality health care. They're not able to afford it. Of course, this can be considered a little bit of kind of a chicken egg. Is it poor health that limits economic mobility, or is it not having economic mobility that causes poor health? Do people sink into the lower classes because of poor health, or do people from the lower classes experience poor health? Uh, but there is a link. There's a correlation between health and economic mobility. The higher you rise, the healthier you become, or better access to health care you have, leading to better outcomes for health. As I said, race and ethnicity play into this. A lot of that may be because of the correlation between lower class, between poverty and minority status. At any rate, um, there is social inequality in the U.S. The healthcare has social uh, healthcare outcomes have inequality, and racial and ethnic groups reflect this inequality. poor economic and environmental conditions manifested in high morbidity and mortality rates for minority groups, racial and ethnic minority groups. African Americans have higher incidence of mortality and infant mortality as well. They have lower expected lifespans. Uh, the idea of cure and Curanderismo um, is holistic health care and healing. Um, a lot of folk medicine, um, and this is something very prevalent in Mexico, Mexican Americans may use here in the U.S. Women experience more illness across the course of life, but they do tend to live an average of five years longer in our society than men do. Some of the factors that lead to this, lower rate of cigarette smoking, lower alcohol consumption, lower rate of employment in dangerous occupations, uh, and women go to the doctors more often. 
they are more likely to seek medical care um, and not try to tough it out the way that men will sometimes do. Healthcare in our society has switched over. During the Industrial Revolution, we have switched over to from treating a prevalence of acute illnesses to treating a prevalence of chronic illnesses. Acute illnesses are illnesses that strike suddenly. Chronic illnesses are illnesses that develop over time. And right now, with longer lifespans, most people in the United States who have reached a certain age are being treated for or suffering from at least one chronic illness, whether it be heart disease, high blood pressure. Um, there are a number of different types of chronic illnesses. Um, of course, senile dementia, um, memory loss, older people, they're vulnerable to certain types of mental health problems. Um, older people do use more health services than younger people. The whole idea behind HMOs was that you get a group of people together that have various ages and various professions, um, all using the same pool of money for health care, and the younger people at the time will be paying premiums in but will not be making withdrawals in the form of seeking services. Mm the older people will be making more withdrawals using health services and at a certain point in time the younger people then start to use more and more as new younger people come in. But older people do have a tendency to use health care a lot more than younger people. Um, they need it more. <sighs> Health care costs have skyrocketed. Um, in the year 2000, the amount spent on health care equaled that spent on education, defense, prison, farm subsidies, food stamps, and foreign aid combined. We spend a lot of money on health care. A lot of bankruptcies are caused by health care bills. Insurance doesn't always cover everything. Okay, taking kind of a historical view of health, um, we looked at the 1830s, 1840s, a popular health movement. This is when you began to see uh, institutionalized authority of medicine, the American Medical Association, uh, through programs of education and licensing restricted the practice of health care. Prior to the AMA beginning to do this, there were all different kinds of people practicing health care. Um, acupuncture, acupressure, phrenology, chiropractic, doctors of osteopathy, medical doctors were all practicing medicine. Um, and then there were what were called the so-called snake oil doctor salesmen. Um, who were selling alcohol combined with other ingredients as health care remedies. And all of this was considered legitimate health care practice. As the AMA began to institutionalize the authority, they began restricting uh, people who could practice medicine. By the 1920s, um, MDs and DOs were the only people really left practicing medicine officially. They controlled the hospital technology, uh, the division of labor of health personnel, and other health professions. Um, chiropractic has had a long road to fight back into respectability to become an accepted form of medical practice. In order for insurance to pay for it, though, oftentimes you have to be referred to a chiropractor by an MD or a DO. So 
So, who has the high status? Well, it's the doctors, the physicians. They have a position of dominance with patients and nurses. Um, this leads to uh, a little bit of dehumanization of the encounters. Doctors uh, act in a very official capacity. They're not interested in, in kind of getting to know the patient. Um, the patient is something to be treated, not an individual um, so what 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 that means is is that oftentimes doctors view patients not as the individuals they are, not people with fears. They view them almost as problems to be solved, um, puzzles to be solved, things to be fixed. And so this leads to a little bit of a, an alienating experience within medicine for patients. Um, further, the, the relationship becomes e strained even more when we look at um, the publicity around malpractice suits, uh, high medical costs, um, and the efforts to place caps on um, malpractice suits in some states have led to a strained relationship between physicians and patients. Um, doctors have controlled interactions with nurses. They are the authority figure there, um, the higher status individual there. Um, it's interesting. I was just watching an episode of South Park last night. It was the episode where they lost the Internet. Um, and Randy was feeling a little sick and didn't know what was wrong with him because he couldn't log on to WebMD to figure it out. Um, if you look at like shows like Dr. Oz show, um, increasingly people are using media outlets uh, for healthcare information. So what are some alternatives to traditional health care? Well, as I said, acupuncture, acupressure, chiropractic used to be one. The idea behind the original idea behind chiropractic is that disease can be alleviated by making sure the spine is in good alignment. Um, now, there are health benefits to having your spine in good alignment, and sciatica is one thing that can be alleviated. By having a strong, healthy spine... Um, but that doesn't mean that um, if you get cancer, having your spine in alignment will make the cancer go away. Uh, but some statistical research indicates that about a third of the population foregoes traditional medicine, traditional health care, and uses um, alternative health care techniques. Uh, something like what we would call holistic medicine. Now, holistic as a term means when you look at the entirety, the whole of something. Instead of individual, like um, in Western medicine, there's kind of a tendency to treat symptoms as being unique. And we fix this particular symptom, okay? We don't consider the overall um, person's physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual characteristics. Um, you find uh, an attitude towards holistic medicine much more prevalent in Asian societies than you do in um, European societies. I mean, even if you think about, like, diet, we are always trying to figure out what's the essential thing that we need to add to food to make it a, a complete, balanced diet. We fortify foods with vitamins and minerals instead of trying to say, well, we should balance the entire diet. No, we just need to add the essential vitamins and minerals, and then we can eat all the junk we want. See how it takes more of a divide and conquer? Well, Western medicine kind of looks at it that way, too. We treat specific illnesses. We treat specific injuries. We're not worried about the overall picture of the individual. We're just focused on that one little thing that's wrong. So... 
what is the role of government in healthcare? It has a role, and right now, that role has actually been expanded through the Affordable Health Care Act. Um, some people, most people are actually getting benefit. The people who are signing up for the, you know, um, on the government exchanges are able to get health care at fairly reasonable rates. Now, there are a few individuals who have been hurt by this. Their rates have actually increased rather than decreasing. But that's really a small percentage. The majority of people who didn't have access to health care before, part of the 51 million people in 2007, 51 million people in the United States of America did not have access to health care. The Affordable Care Act has really reduced that number substantially. I want to say there's about 30 million people now who have health care, and the number continues to grow of people who have health care who didn't before. But this began in 1946. First subsidies for building and improving hospitals, especially in rural areas, the Hill-Burton action. In 1965, we had Medicare and Medicaid established. Um, these are socialized medicine for the elderly in the case of Medicare and for the needy in the case of Medicaid. Um, these are pro there are programs that expand federal involvement in health care financing. Um, during the 70s, um, HMOs um, were widely supported uh, by President Nixon. In 1983, the government instituted the cost control program, trying to keep the cost of medicine down. Hasn't worked that well, but every president since Lyndon Johnson has tried to provide universal health care in some form or another. We are the only high-income industrialized nation that does not provide universal health care. Canada, Australia, Great Britain, France, Germany, Japan, all of these countries have universal health care. They make sure that every single one of their citizens has access to health care. This has not been something that has been done in the United States of America. Um, the Affordable Health Care Act is trying to move towards that. The elimination of the public option uh, made it more difficult to implement. And the public option would have essentially been Medicare extended to every single person in the United States of America. Um, instead of just 65 and older. Okay, moving on now, mental illness. Now, mental illness, Irving Goffman was a sociologist who did a lot of work on mental illness. In fact, he wrote a book called Stigma, looking specifically at people who suffer mental illnesses. Why are they stigmatized? Mental illness is a medical illness, it's a disorder of the brain that disrupts a person's thinking, feeling, and ability to interact with others. The problem with mental illness is the people who suffer from mental illness are claiming the sick role, but they're not exhibiting the attitudes and behaviors expected of people who claim the sick role. That's part of the problem, why it becomes um, stigmatized. In the 19, I want to say at the end of the 60s, beginning of the 70s, sometime in that era, um, prior to that, people with mental illnesses had places that they would be placed, um, where they would live. After that period in time, the government stopped funding a lot of what were called sanitariums, asylums. And a lot of people with minor mental illnesses were just released back into the general population, and we saw our homeless population kind of explode at the same time. Now, some of the shortcomings currently, 
Many officials do not understand how to diagnose, detect and diagnose medical, mental health issues. So a lot of officials are poorly prepared to do that. Um, the DSM-5, uh, which is the, the diagnostic manual used to diagnose mental, symptom, mental illnesses, um, was just released. It's a huge book. It's hard to master, so we can't expect that everybody is going to be able to master it to be able to diagnose and detect mental illnesses. As I said, following the, six, the following that period when a lot of mental um, illness facilities were shut down, there's a limitation for mental health services. They're limited in availability. A lot of them will not be covered by insurance. The stigma that I referred to, people do not want to be someone who has a mental illness because it's a stigmatized condition. So that may discourage people from seeking help. They don't need help. I'll just deal with it. So when we look at models of mental disorders, there's the medical model. Mental illness is rooted in biological causes that can be treated through medical intervention. This is probably the most prevalent model. If you think about it, all the drugs we have that treat certain disorders, certain mental disorders, we really are invested in the medical model. This has, of course, limited a lot of useful therapy like talk therapy and things like that, counseling. Counseling has been reduced as medicine has increased in the treatment of mental illness. Uh, mental illness is not an illness according to labeling theory um, since the individual's problems arise from living in society. Um, so it's something that is externally imposed, a label. So labeling theory kind of devalues mentally ill patients um, because it's saying they're, they're not suffering from a real illness. Mental illness has been a governmental concern longer than physical illness. Going before, there have been lunatic asylums far back in time. Um, the mentally ill have been confined, public safety issues. Um, so the confinement of the insane or mentally ill to public institutions predates, um, I mean, asylums go back into the 17th century, maybe even earlier than that. In 1963, uh, we saw Community Mental Health Centers Act increase federal government involvement in the treatment of mentally ill. Um, a lot of that was in the form of funding, but it also made it um, easier to commit mentally ill homeless involuntarily, people who might be suffering from schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, something like that, um, depending on how it was being labeled at the time, uh, according to the DSM. But it made it easier to commit people involuntarily. Um, as I said, a lot of that was eliminated. Um, and a lot of the people who had been institutionalized were then released back into the general population. In the 70s, we saw our uh, homeless population explode as a result of this. So moving on to the environment. What is the environment? The environment is basically whatever surrounds you. It's where you live. And the environment in which you live has a notable noticeable effect on health. If we look at the level of pollution, smog, in certain areas, when we talk about increases in population with economic development, if we look at what we see pictures coming out of Beijing right now, there, where you have a lot of economic development, they're undergoing industrialization, and they have a fairly substantial population there. Um, 
creates serious environmental consequences. This has happened in the U.S. L.A. is a smog basin. Mexico City, where you have a large population, you have same kind of environmental concerns there. Human ecology is the interaction between people and the environment. It's the interrelationships between people in their spatial settings and physical environments. The field of human ecology focuses on the benefits and consequences of decisions that alter the environment. Um, just recently, there was a federal act passed that all cars being produced, new cars that are being produced, have to achieve a certain mileage. Um, they can't be below a certain mileage. I want to say it's 35, might be 30, 35 miles to the gallon. So every vehicle produced will have to at least achieve that. Now, that's because the gas guzzlers pump a lot more um, carbon into the atmosphere. And so there are trade-offs. The whole idea of the G8 summit, of the environmental accords, uh, are governments trying to work with environmentalists to determine how to provide for the needs of everybody, but at the same time doing it in a way that's environmentally sound. The conflict view that you see right here, resources of developing countries redistribu redistributed to core industrialized nations. This comes out of Emmanuel Wallerstein's um, world systems analysis. What we talk about here, um, ecological modernization, it's uh, an alignment of environmentally favorable practices with economic self-interest through constant adaptation and restructuring. Uh, in the Phoenix area, they are using um, recycled material to actually build homes. So environmentally favorable practices with economic self-interest. We can build a cheaper home and charge people less money for the home by using recycled materials. And at the same time, using recycled materials ensures that we're <coughs> trying to preserve the environment. The idea of environmental justice or environmental injustice um, Racial minorities are disproportionately subjected to environmental hazards. There's a great example of this in a documentary called The World According to Monsanto, um, where there's a minority community near a Monsanto plant that produces uh, Roundup, and the runoff from this Roundup is just dumped into the stream, into the water supply, and so it's become a cancer cluster. Um, and the reason that it happens there is because um, minorities don't necessarily have the resources to combat this type of behavior. Um, so think about something like, you know, uh, Aaron Brockovich, if anybody's seen that movie. Now, the way that that movie played out, they didn't really focus on, like, race. They focused on class. Uh, but remember, there's a correlation between race and class. Where the hexavalent chromium was being dumped was in a poor community that wouldn't have the legal resources to fight it or even understand it, really. So environmental justice is the idea that environmental hazards are placed um, disproportionately in low-income communities. And racial minorities are disproportionately subjected to environmental hazards because they live they constitute a higher proportion of low-income communities. So what are the problems we have? Well, you can see right there, right? All the exhaust that's pumping into the area. So air pollution, water pollution, and global warming. 
those are our three broad areas of concern with regards to environmental problems. Where are we going to get enough clean water for everybody to drink? What are we going to breathe? And how are we going to keep the planet from warming? How does globalization play into this? Well, industrialization increases pollution, but multinational corporations do have incentives to carefully consider the cost of natural resources. Environmental refugees are one reflection of interplay between globalization and the environment. Um, a lot of environmental refugees ha are created when we have toxic spills, accidents, that kind of stuff that contribute to making certain areas unlivable. So, environmentalism is a social movement. 1970, 25 million people turned out to observe the first Earth Day. There still is an Earth Day every year. Uh, citizens marched on behalf of specific environmental causes, global warming, air pollution, water pollution. Um, so Congress established the Environmental Protection Agency, the agency that is supposed to have jurisdiction over pollution and is supposed to be able to find uh, individuals and corporations that pollute excessively. Clean Air, Clean Water, and Endangered Species Acts all came out of this. Um, part of the problem, though, is that um, the way these acts were written, um, companies are supposed to prevent pollution, but if they do pollute, then they pay a fine. And companies can buy, essentially, the right to pollute. Earth Day, as I said, still occurs. It shows up on calendars worldwide in various areas. Um, efforts to publicize concerns are moving to the Internet. I'm sure everybody gets emails about um, environmental issues periodically. There's this idea that there's a controversy over some of these environmental issues. Um, are they actually man-made or not? General public has mixed reactions to environmental issues. And if we think about the routinization of bureaucracy, um, the bureaucratic structures within the largest environmental organizations um, have begun to become routinized in there. So when we think about sociology and looking at environmentalism, most powerful environmental organizations are predominantly white, male-dominated, and affluent. So the conflict perspective says that major organizations accept funding from powerful corporations, including oil and chemical companies. And so the problem becomes if you're getting funding from oil and chemical companies, your interests then become the interests of those oil and chemical companies. And so that's where the trouble occurs. There's been a lot of resistance to the environmental movement. Um, and we have to think about this sometimes. Yes, it's true that we should not consume as much electricity as we do. We should find other ways to power our society. Electricity is clean, but 51% of the electricity produced in the United States of America comes from burning coal, more than 50%. You know, a, a big percentage of it comes from burning coal. Now, we should stop that, but what do we replace it with? How do we become environmentally conscious without causing a collapse in our society?
So, we look at what happened in 2008. Yeah, a lot of people got hurt. But the economic downturn, the Great Recession, reduced the use of fossil fuels, established funds for creating green-collar jobs. When we talk about green-collar jobs, those are jobs in um, non-polluting industries, industries, you know, that are designed around creating clean energy, uh, solar power, wind power, things like that. Uh, environmentalism moved on to a bigger stage, and people became increasingly reluctant to ignore environmental issues. More and more people believe that global warming is a phenomenon that is caused by man and that we should do something about it as a society. So, this concludes our look at health and the environment. Uh, my name is Matthew Howell. My email address is mhowell1 at ivytech.edu. That's M-H-O-W-E-L-L-1 -L at ivytech.edu. Um, if you would like to attend these live, just send me an email, and I will be sure to send you a link.